Hey guys, it's Barbie and Flo. She's in the Bible. Thanks for stopping by. We're doing our second um, Bible trivia today. Um, and it's um, we just did one here recently on Ezra. And this one again, we're not going to reveal who the person is. At least we're going to try not to. This is our third time doing this recording because both of us have revealed right in the very beginning who this person is. It's hard not to say it. So. Hopefully this one's going to be third time is the charm. So we're going to get ready. We're going to be talking about family, divine dealings, and death. We are introduced to this person right off the bat. He's pretty much the coolest guy alive, and life is good for him. He has a big family, lots of property. Oh, and he is one of the most righteous men out there. Not bad. Not bad. And God is even psyched about how awesome he is. So he brags to Satan. As you might accept, expect, Satan doesn't agree. He says that he is only holy and righteous because his life is so good. Okay, challenge on, God says. God agrees to let Satan destroy his life, you know, just to see what happens. Mm -hmm. Go. Yeah, Satan does destroy his life. But guess what? He remains loyal to God, understanding that God gives and God takes away. Only his his wife and a few servants survive the destruction. No, not no, not more. But yeah, God gets back to bragging about him, and Satan once again doesn't buy it. This time, God gives Satan permission to hurt him physically, something he didn't let him do the first time. Just don't kill him, God says. Satan's method of choice, give him sores from his tippy toes to his noggin. Mm -hmm. His wife apparently doesn't find this too attractive because she suggests that he curse God and die, but he refuses to be disloyal. His friends and his buddies come to visit and chill with him while he rolls around in ash and sackcloth. This is all standard procedure, don't worry. All right, and um, this person calls his birthday a crummy holiday. Suddenly, the text moves from prose to poetry. He cries out that he is in pain and rues the day he was born, poetically, of course. And his friends call angels the bad flyers. Breaking the silence, his friend throws his two cents in. He says that he must have done something wrong to merit this punishment. Innocents, he says, are never punished. And hey, if God gets anointed as angels, how can humans pass the test? Basically, humans have no chance. Don't forget, folks, he is still maintaining his innocence. His friend decides God's punishment is good for this person. His buddy is still chatting away. Now he says that God doles out both good and bad and that the righteous have nothing to fear from him. Finally, some good news. (laughs) But our main character hits back. He isn't buying it. He's in pain. He's covered with sores and ashes, and he wants some answers. His complaint's valid, he says. He gets that his friends are confused. After all, in their worldview, the righteous are not punished. But he's not satisfied with that answer. The pain spirit. He decides he won't take this line down. This is This is his why me moment. I'm sure we've all done that. Why me? Mm -hmm. He asks God why he specifically has become God's target. He's in such pain that even death would be better. We're really starting to feel for this guy. And then enter another friend, stage left. Friend number two tells him to repent. Why, he thinks, it could have been his kids who sinned and brought this misery upon him. Then he gets all poetic, comparing his suffering to a garden sown with bad seeds from his past or from his um, offspring. Hasn't your past ever come back to haunt you? Mm -hmm. Friend number two is just trying to give the situation some sense for his buddy. Oh, what would we do without friends? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, gosh. Okay, so this person regrets the man-god connection. He wants a mediator. Can't someone just judge who's right, him or God? Because really, if God is omniscient and omnipotent, then what? 
he did was really, really mean. Friends, <clears throat> he laments that there is no justice between mortals and immortals. And then he demands a trial with God. He hates his life. He continues his bumming out session, asking God why he would oppress the people who love him. Doesn't really seem like a good business model. Another friend gets all up in his face. Time for more thoughts from the peanut gallery. Friend, he must have done something wrong. God is unfathomable, fathomable, sir, but he always punishes people less than they deserve. Some friend. Mm -hmm. it, right? You know, you must have done something really bad, you know, and even though he was known as the most righteous, but yeah, you must have done something really bad. He issues his reply to his amigos, friends in the peanut gallery. Now that he knows all his friends are kinds of kind of jerks, he talks back. After all, he says, he's their equal, and well, they're not being very nice. He knows that God is almighty, sure, but he's he deserves an explanation for why God is shredding his life to pieces. He's mortal. His time is short. He wants some answers. Okay, so then the friend, you got a friend and a buddy retorts. Friend is back on the scene. He says that he is undermining God by questioning his ways, which are both unknowable and infinite. infinite. We feel like we've heard that one before. He continues to say that sinful are doomed for that the sinful are doomed for destruction. And you know who falls into that sinful category. That's right, he does. And here comes one of the most famous phrases in the Bible. Your own steps testify against you. He demands a hearing. In case we didn't get the picture already, he reiterates how uncool his friends are. Then he, yep again, confirms that he has done nothing worthy of this punishment. Why shouldn't he, a penitent man, get a fair hearing? Laura, you want to tell us? Yep. And a friend is going to step up to the bat once again. His other friend is back. And guess what he's saying this time? That's right. God punishes the wicked. This time, though, he adds in a possible reference to Canaanite lore that the firstborn of death will visit the evil. Uh, don't know about that one. Um, I will be redeemed. <laughs> Apparently, no one is listening. So he reaffirms his desire to plead his case before God. He's so worked up about it, he wants to etch his complaint in something more permanent than his mortal voice. Maybe on a rock or a surprise, surprise in a book. Maybe the Bible. Um Friend and his ass. Friends decides to beat a dead horse, not literally. He tells him that the wicked get what they deserve from God. For good measure, he adds that the venom of asp and poison people's stomachs and kill the sinners. Well, that's pretty graphic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. He refutes his friend. He sticks to his guns. The wicked, he said, go unpunished all the time. Not that he's cool with that. He prays for the sinner's destruction and then tells him to stop being so depressing. One more time, friend has something to say. His friend won't back down. He tells him that he definitely messed up somehow to merit such crazy punishment. And according to this major downer, the rules are the rules. If you're being punished, you must have done something wrong. When talking to God might look like, he reflects on what he would do if he were actually allowed to present his case to God. He makes the call. He would heed him, but not contend with him. God is, after all, God. Contending may not be the best idea. Next up, a long monologue about the state of violence on earth. Yeah, this one's a downer. His friend poses a question. His question is short, but punchy. He asks him, how can a mortal be righteous? And he replies with belief. He is ready with an answer. He declares that, of course, God is the master of the universe. But it doesn't matter. He still deserves some explanation. God may be within everyone and everywhere, but he's still as mysterious as they come. And when it affects people like him, 
those people need some answers. <coughs> and Barbie, let you take it from there. Yeah, I gotta love them friends putting all these crazy ideas in his head, you know, making things. Mm -hmm. even though they probably, I guess, maybe were trying to make it better. But I think they were definitely making it worse. Talk about Debbie Downers. <laughs> yeah. He maintains his position, divine justice. He refers back down, back down from his earlier position. Yeah, it's a little repetitive, but hey, the guy's gone through a lot. Mm -hmm. Then it starts getting interesting. We're not sure who's talking, but it's a discussion of divine justice and how the evildoers, the non-believers, will get what's coming to them from God. Is this if this is speaking, it's probably an ironic speech, given that it's been yammering on about how divine justice has wronged a righteous man. Mm -hmm. Getting tired? Good. It's time to shake up things. In this unsigned interlude, the speaker riffs for a while about where the seeker can find wisdom. Answer? We're still not sure. We suggest you go back and read this passage. It's pretty poetic. It doesn't hurt that we're still in po poetry here. He makes the call. He would heed him, but not contend with him. God is, after all, God. Contending may not be the best idea. <clears throat> Next up is a long monologue about the state of violence on the earth. I'm sorry, I said the wrong thing. That's okay. Sorry about that. Okay, let's keep going. The moral of the story is that wisdom lives with God. To fear the scope and power of this divine wisdom is to be truly wise in a human sense. Kind of how a truly wise man knows that he knows nothing. Please his words. One more time. Yep, more laminating. He isn't happy with the pain and embarrassing nature of his position. He reminisces about the good old days and tries to understand why he's being punished. He concludes mm -hmm. that he has done all God asked and that God owes him an explanation. Hey, haven't we heard that? We've heard that before. <clears throat> oh, that's right. Everywhere in this entire book. Okay, here comes another friend. This friend <laughs> comes out of nowhere. He's only mentioned in these passages, but his speech adds a new layer to his other friend's words, so pay attention. He starts by stating that he is younger than the other three and that he is only speaking out of concern for him, and that's fair enough. He then tells him that he isn't necessarily a sinner, but that his misfortunes are just part of a cycle of divine power that cannot be questioned or understood. It just is. This guy is very, clearly very chill. He basically tells him that he's not necessarily a sinner just because he's being punished. But his reaction to that punishment is an expression of foolishness. So yeah, he's calling him a fool. There's mm -hmm. your good friend though. <laughs> and, you know, he's he tells it like he is. Yeah, I mean, he's the youngest one but the most smartest out of all. You know, maybe he didn't. Yes. You know, maybe it's just things happen. Yep. There's a reason. And then, it, mm -hmm, there he is. And then we're going to enter God. He comes down in a whirlwind and poses a number of rhetorical questions to him, all of which are designed to show him how small he is in relation to the universe, which, by the way, God created. You should probably go back and check this part out. Some of the questions are pretty awesome. God's wisdom isn't like human wisdom. After all, God is concerned with making waves flow and the architecture of the heavens. You know, the big deal things. Mm -hmm. This doesn't mean that human affairs don't concern him. They're just one part of a vast, unknowable whole. Basically, his question is answered with a bunch of equally unanswered questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. He is completely and totally out of his league on this one. God talks of natural things in human terms so that he can understand them. And by doing so, he illustrates how the mortal and the immortal are so far apart, even though they are physically close together. 
It's pretty deep, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, and by the way, a lot of these passages make their way into modern thought. Again, just go ahead and read it. And then take two. God, um, he splutters a mere two verses in response to God's line of questioning. Wouldn't you be a little freaked out too? And then God cuts him off. He's known to be an interrupter. This time, he has some important news. He is not guilty or innocent, just powerless. He has been condemning God to justify himself. And this is just plain uncool. Yeah, it is. Well, all's well that ends well. We're going to get, get ready for a happy ending. <clears throat> he is cool and he pledges his loyalty to God. And don't worry, his friends get their Tommy puns. They're rebuked for giving him bad advice. And he goes on to live a happy, prosperous life. Once he, you know, understood, you know, the right what was going on and repented and and pledges his loyalty to god but he really never gave up his loyalty he just wanted answers you know because mm -hmm. he was being loyal and what what just happened um, anybody guess who this person might be yet drum roll it's you know anytime something goes wrong in the world what do people say just remember job well, mm -hmm. that's why, because Job lost a lot. He lost his property. He lost his family. He lost his money, his finances, and then ultimately his health. So, mm -hmm. But he stood strong. He did. I think it's also good that, you know, we kind of joke through this, but Sometimes, you know, you need to pray and look to God instead of looking to your friends because sometimes yes. you don't get the best advice from the friend. <laughs> friends might mean well, but you mm -hmm. always get the best advice. So, you know, whether you're listening to a friend or you're listening, you know, or you're, or you're listening to a prophet, take it to God, take it to the scripture, mm -hmm. take it to the word. So you don't get bad advice like Job did because Job got some pretty bad advice. You know, he was being looked at like, what did you do wrong? What mm -hmm. something? This wouldn't have happened if you hadn't have done something wrong. You know? Yep. Wrong. You know, so that not always, you know, not nobody's immune from having some bad things happen. I remember when my mom got cancer and then my dad became a paraplegic right after that. And then my grandmother, my dad's mom, got cancer. All like, mm -hmm. you know, in the same time, you know, which is bam, bam, bam. And my aunt <clears throat> calling me up and asking me what we had done wrong in our family because we must have a curse to have all that happen at once. And I was like, mm, you do realize my grandmother's 93. And, you know, people do get sick. Uh, I'm pretty sure this isn't a curse. I think things just happen. Yeah, but that was kind of like one of Job's friends, you know. Thanks. You know, mm -hmm. your family do wrong. And that's a good example, Barbie. I think all of us, uh, you know, when some sometimes when things are going wrong in our life, we do question. Mm -hmm. We're human, mm -hmm. you know, but it's not a, I don't believe in uh, there's curses and things like that. I think it, we just give it to God. He's going to work it out. There's a reason behind everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is. There is. And, you know, Satan at this point in time until he's cast out of heaven permanently is allowed to go from earth to heaven. And they call, a lot of people call it like the courts of heaven. God is the judge. Satan is the prosecutor and Jesus is um, the defense attorney. And, you know, Satan's allowed to go up there and say, well, Barbie just did this, this, and this. She hasn't repented of that sin yet. And so Jesus can't defend me, you know, because I haven't repented. But if I repented, he just says, hey, look, dude, uh -uh, she's covered by the blood. You know, you can't. Mm -hmm. But if I wasn't a Christian or if I had not repented, then, Jesus, you know, he steps back. And God is allowed to let. God allows Satan to do. You know, that's mm -hmm. why it's so important. Put that full armor on every day. Put that full armor. Yep. 
Make sure you repent. That doesn't mean feel guilty and all that stuff. Just when you realize you've done it, just ask for forgiveness. That's all it takes. It's very simple. Well, that was really enjoyed that one. I really did. Even three times because we kept saying his name. I said it three times within the first 30 seconds to a minute. I finally was like, Barbie, I think we probably need to stop the video. <laughs> yeah, I think you're probably right. And then the second floor says it too. So it, it's hard not saying it, but I hope you enjoyed it. Have a good one. Bye. Bye, y'all. Thanks.